Hi and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Now coming up on this week's show we have a little look at the supply chain problems in the mountain bike industry at the moment. We also check out that Nuke Proof Giga, the super enduro beast. I mean this is ridiculous. We also have a look at some cool UK manufacturing and some wicked rewind entries from you lovely lot. Okay, so straight into the show and into this week's topic, a bit of a different one actually. I've been looking through the comments and it seems there's a lot of you out there struggling to get hold of bikes and moaning about the pricing of bikes at the moment because let's face it, there is a bit of a supply problem and some bike costing is going up. Now, there's a lot of factors to do with this, so just bear with us here because this is a tiny bit of our show. This isn't a dedicated video, but I do think there is some proper background work to go into this. Now really, there's never been such a good time to buy a bike. So many people are coming into cycling, which is great. So many people are discovering mountain biking. Brilliant. But the problem is everyone's so desperate to buy bikes because of what's been happening in the world over the last year that there is a supply problem because of the fact that we can't supply that demand. Uh, I say we as in the bike industry can't supply that demand. The factories have issues. Now this isn't an exclusive thing to cycling, you're seeing this in every industry because of the fact, let's just say you can't get those raw materials, your, your metals for example, if you're a frame manufacturer. If you're not getting them into the factory, you're not getting the frames out. But if you can get those frames out of the factory into the bike manufacturer who you're going to put the bike together, they might not be able to get a fork, for example, which might have up to a 12 month, even a 14 month waiting or a lead time on, on some of the stuff which we're hearing now. 14 months waiting for components. Now, you know, this is no one company's uh, fault. You know, everyone is a victim of this. And I, I feel sorry for anyone that's trying to sort out this mess has happened, but no one could foresee what was going to happen when COVID struck, really. And I think actually it's a bit of a lesson in future, and I'm sure some companies are actually going to work on sort of methods to get around this sort of stuff, uh, preemptive strike, if you were. So I actually want to speak to a few more bike companies about this. But one of the things that was my attention has been drawn to when speaking to a few major distributors and brand, bike brands in the Far East is the shipping problem. Now, I don't know how much you know about this. There's quite a few newspaper stories on this. I've read some stuff in The Guardian about it as well. But it's big shipping problems. So for starters, there's a lack of containers in Asia. So can you imagine those huge shipping containers? There's not enough of them. So what's happening is there's just been such a bottleneck of stuff getting out of Asia and getting over to the UK or Europe or America or wherever it's being shipped that those empty containers afterwards, they're just piling up on the docks and they're not getting back on the ships because the amount of time it takes to get them back on, it takes too much time. Now, because these bottlenecks, there's not been enough cranes at the docks to unload the ships properly. So some of the ships are coming in and they, they will have a very limited window that they have to unload within and then leave basically because they get charged for it because you're taking up someone else's docking spot. Now, I've heard stories of some bike manufacturers, uh, some in the UK, some in Europe, having bikes arrive at the dock or at least they, they track them in so they know they're on that shipment, they're waiting for them to get unloaded, but they're not getting unloaded because uh, they're trying to get everything off as quick as possible and leave and get onto the next destination. So they've had shipping containers not getting off the ship when they're supposed to, going back to going to America and then back to Asia again. So you think by the time it comes back to the UK, if it takes, what, a month or like 35 days or something to come from Asia to the UK, then you've got to add to America, then back to Asia, and then back to the UK. It's insane. Now, this is happening in every single industry. And then there's the pricing of those containers as well, which is a really, really big problem. So I hear uh, for most major distributors, you're talking between like uh, six and eight quid or something like that for a bike. Uh, that's obviously pounds sterling to get uh, to fill out those containers. Now you're talking more like 60 quid. You're talking about, you know, a 10 times price increase. This is absolutely insane to fill up those containers. And as a result, the distributors are not only not making any money, but it's costing distributors money to bring bikes into the country to then ship over to, or ship or to send to bike shops, to, which are going to customers. And they're already sold bicycles as well. So it's just costing the bike industry money to get people on bikes. It's just crazy. And then of course there's Brexit. That's, well, <laughs> uh, can't even be bothered to talk about Brexit. It's just been an absolute mess from the start, isn't it? Uh, now, as a result, the UK technically, I guess you could call it like a third country, I think the, the term is. So uh, anything you're ordering from Europe, if you're based in the UK, you're gonna pay a tariff, like an import charge, I guess, kind of like buying stuff from the States. You have to pay an import duty on it. So it's the same thing. And as a result, bike prices are all slightly going up. If you're buying a bike from a European bike brand or a bike brand that comes direct, you might be suffering. So we are gonna look into it in more depth, but you need to kind of understand that we're not alone. This is happening all over the world and it's a monumental problem. 
but it's also kind of cool that there's such demand for people to ride bikes in the first place. And I love that because more people on bikes makes the world a better place, ultimately. Now, have you had any issues with getting hold of a bike recently or the costing of bikes? Um, we'd like to know about it. If you have, uh, feel free to mention the bike brand, anyone that's been particularly helpful for you because we know that bike shops are like clawing trying to get hold of bikes. I mean, even though some resourceful bike shops, they've been buying like uh, warranty frames, like spare frames and building them up themselves and getting them out the door because they've been so desperate. That was their mountain mania. Great thinking by you guys for doing that. Um, there's just so many stories we keep hearing about what's going on. So we're gonna take a step back and have a look into this to, to see what's going on. But uh, if you've got any issues, we'd love to know. Now, I just wanna give a props actually to Propane Cycles. They put this press release up on their website and they sent it to us as well and various other people. Um, we're gonna put a link to it in the description underneath. And they're being completely transparent about Brexit and the pricing and how this affects you. Of course, Brexit's not gonna affect everyone in the, in the world, I'm talking physically about uh, people here in the UK, but it's a good example of other issues that just happen to be uh, stacked on top of all the COVID issues as well. So have a read of that. It makes for interesting reading. And uh, well, if you're about to buy a bike and you see one you like, buy it straight away is my advice. Or you're gonna be spending money on components, doing up what you've already got, which is no bad thing. But uh, if you're looking for a new bike, you could be in for a long wait. Let's face it, if you've got your money down on a 2021 bike, you might even be seeing 2022 bikes by the time you get it, which just seems crazy. But uh, whatever happens, good luck and enjoy the ride. Okay, so straight into news now, and the first thing I'm gonna talk about is that brand new Nuke Proof. Look at this thing, this is called the Giga. Now this is the super enduro bike. Yeah, so they've already got enduro bike, haven't they? They've got the Mega, the Mega, well, it's mega, it's an amazing bike. Why would you need more? Well, I guess because you could have one of these. Now, I'm just gonna fire up some images on screen. And you might notice it's got a very different looking suspension platform from what you've seen on the mega, and of course on the reactor. Uh, now, this looks a little bit like, you might have spotted the descent, the downhill bike, and that's kind of how they got there. Now, when they were developing the suspension system for the descent, they actually found it pedaled so well on one of their mule bikes that they were using just to do the configurations, which wasn't a full travel bike, that they decided that they needed to rework that into something else. So they still pushed forward with the descent that was released and they kept this mule bike, which they called the Mulse, um, Pulse Mule, perhaps, something like that. But I guess the Pulse was the older bike before they named the descent, but um, yeah, it's called the Mulse. So interesting bike. And there's a shot of it here actually, on screen of what the original looked like before the Giga actually came to fruition. But they parked that idea because they liked it so well, but they're also simultaneously working on the reactors and the megas and pushing everything out in a range, but they revisited. And I'm glad they did because this Giga is an absolute animal. So a few more shots on screen. So there's five frame sizes, as you see with other Nuke Proof bikes, up to double XL. So the sizing is bang up there with that Mega. So you get 29 inch and 27 and a half inch versions. The 29 inch has 170, 180 mil travel, like 180 up front. The 27 and a half is 180 front and rear, 180 mil bike. So this is bike parks, this is fun. This is just beast mode stuff. If you're doing a season, do you know what? Do you need a downhill bike? Something like that could be what you want, especially a pair of 38s or a Zab up on the front there. That's an absolute beast and you could ride it all day long as well. So a um, bit much travel for me, I've got to say, but uh, I'd love to have a go on one of these. So uh, loads of cool stuff. They've designed a geometry again around saddle offset. So the bike is a very aggressive bike, but loads of room, massive long front center in there. Proportional chain stays on the bike. Seat angle is gonna be slightly steeper on the large the extra large and the double XL sizing. I mean, look at it. Look how low slung it looks with that back end. I just think it looks amazing. Okay, well, I'm just looking at the same images you are here. So the reach on the small is 435 up to 520 on that double XL there. Uh, seat angle on there is 77.75 on the small than medium. On the large, the extra large and the double XL is nearer 78 degrees. So that's a great angle on there. 63 and a half degrees up front. This thing is designed for full on battle mode, I tell you. Uh, 435 mil chain stays on the back, so neither too short, neither too long. It's like an optimal amount on there. Now looking at the hardware and the stuff in there, some interesting things to say about the way the back end works. I'll get to that in a minute, but hardware on there. So it's a T700 and 800 monocoque carbon fiber frame. It's got a two position adjustable main pivot. So the cool thing about the pivot place on this is you can move this to adjust how progressive you want the back end on there. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, some courses you need more support. Other courses, you want to take the fatigue away and just let it 
hit all that travel straight out, have a slightly more linear feel to it. So awesome looking thing. It's got the SRAM UDH rear hanger on there. So that's the universal derailleur hanger. Bravo to SRAM again for making that. And uh, I guess bravo to Nupri for specking it. Boost 148 on the back, loads of mud clearance for big 2.6 inch tires on there. Uh, international standard chain guide mounts on there. You can fit a water bottle in the front triangle, threaded 73 mil bottom bracket shell. The list goes on, there's armor built on there on the chain stay. Uh, it's one of the silencers, just like you saw on the Mega, which is exceptionally quiet. Internal channeling on the frame, so your cables are super easy and your hoses to feed straight in and they don't rattle around. It's dead silent, beautiful looking bike. You say dead silent because um, I know because Rich has already got one of these and Neil's already got one of these. And in fact, I think Rich is doing a bike check on his one coming out at the weekend. So you can see in a bit more detail and see him shredding on it as well because he's already been smoking on that bike today. Now something quite cool about this over the Mega is just about how much more aggressive this bike is intended to be. So you might just think, oh, it's only a few mil, you know, it's only got um, 30 mil more travel on the back or 20 mil more travel, but the fact is this is designed to ride the roughest terrain much harder. There's actually sort of, I think it's 50 mil rearwards um, axle movement before it starts curving around just for those rearward hits. This thing is really designed to smash it hard but yet it still has quite a high anti-squat value in those low climbing gears. Uh, they've done exactly what they offered on the Mega and the Reactor by reducing that anti-squat when it gets down to the higher gears, the runs where you're really pedaling, because they don't want to get any feedback through the pedals. They want it to be really good with flat pedals, really comfortable at speed. So this thing, like, they thought of everything on it. Again, it's just a beautiful looking bike. Um, what do you think of it? I think it looks really, really nice. Okay, next up in news isn't something that new, but I wanted to re-report on it because I actually saw the benefits of Gorilla Gravity um, a couple of years ago now. And in fact, we had a good chat to them when we were last out at Sea Otter. Great crew, Colorado based, and they make and manufacture bikes in, in the US, in Colorado. And they've got some very cool things that they do. So they've developed their own way of making carbon, which is, the actual carbon itself is known as revved carbon. So it is technically stronger, it's more impact proof, it's easy to recycle as well, and it's machine made. It's not handmade in the same way that it requires a lot of human hours as such to sort of pad out the mold. The way the computer does these things, or the machine makes these frames up, it means there's minimal waste and it's much faster. I think they say, yes, 80% reduction time in manufacturing. So this is a, like a really significant thing. Now, if this wasn't enough already, of course, I'm talking about this because Johan Borelli is riding on them now, and He's big news for that brand, I tell you, because the brand is already making great stuff, but with the way he thinks about things, it's, a, it's like a perfect match, it really is, as far as a bike partnership with the rider goes. I th I'm really excited to see what they're gonna achieve over the coming year or so, or whatever his contract's for. So the frame design themselves is what really interests me, because it's a modular approach. So there's various different models on 29 and 27 and a half. In 29, they've got 120 up to 160. So the 120 model's a trail pistol. The 160 is the Narvana, and I think that's the one that Johan Borelli is riding. In 27 and a half, there's 130 up to 155. So it's a shred dog up to the mega trail. But fundamentally, they're pretty much the same mainframe. The cool thing about this is you can have, well, first you can adjust the reach on it. The way they've built the headstock headsets, um, headstock head tube system on there is you can adjust it by 10 mil by flipping around the internal, basically the headstock that the headset cups sit into. It's a brilliant system, super fast, 10 mil reach, instantly changing your wheelbase on that front center. Great way of changing the handling on your bikes. And as Johan's actually already reported, he's playing around with riding a bigger bike than he would normally uh, because he's quite influenced by riding longer, fast bikes at the moment. He wants to see if this one works for him. Now, in addition to that, you get the lower cup, 15 mil or zero. Zero you would have for a 29 inch wheel, 15 mil for 27 and a half. So you can change the fork sizing and the wheel sizing on those frames. And then the seat stay kit as well, you can change. You can have different amounts of travel per bike. So it's a really modular system. So if you had, if you wanted to, you could have two sets of wheels, uh, two sets of forks and two shocks, and you've got two complete bikes. I might argue that's a lot of money to spend, but the fact is for race tuning and for performance riding, you've got a lot of options with a single frame. You're not put into a corner of once you bought it, that's where you are. You can do pretty much what you want with it. And from what I read on this website, these guys are awesome. Really cool brand. Definitely want to be doing something with them at some point. Uh, I'd love to know what you think of them. Do you like their bikes? What do you think of the name? Do you think they're mental? Do you think your home Borelli is the, uh, the right person for the brand? Because I sure as hell do. 
Okay, so more manufacturing talk. Now this is quite cool. So Caliber bikes, we've always we've spoken very highly of them. In particular, they've got the Boss Nut and then that Century Enduro bike. Uh, what else do they have? The Triple B, the Line, uh, Line 10 and Line 20 bikes as well. Now they're incredible value bikes with hand chosen components on them. But like everyone else, they're feeling a pinch when it comes to getting small parts and components from the Far East because of exactly what's been going on, what we talked about in a topic. So they've decided to bring all that manufacturing to the UK. So uh, on screen is a grab of Caliber bikes. And I think bravo again to them for actually tackling this like now, getting it done. You can buy kits for the Boss Nut, the Sentry, the Triple B, the Line 10 and the Line 20. So if you've got one of those frames, you're safe now. You can get axles, bearings, hardware for that, um, main pivots, shock yokes, linkages, neck hangers and dropouts for the brand. I think that's great, and I think you're gonna start seeing a lot more of this. You'll definitely see this with UK brands, and I'm sure you're gonna see this with US brands. Uh, Gorilla Gravity are great at doing this already, and there's gonna be more. So watch this space, because I think there's some good discussion about what's going on with manufacturing and what it really means in the future. Now, I did wanna talk about the uh, a new bike that's launching from Ragley tomorrow, but um, well, I can't because it's launching tomorrow, but I can assure you it's really quite nice. So we're gonna have to skip this one, unfortunately. There's a little pointless bit of news, but uh, there's a cool bike from Ragley coming tomorrow. So Instagram, tool related today. First up, Porter Cycles. Look at that mallet. Yeah. <laughs> How cool is that? That's super nice. There's a uh, Rolling Dale Cycles. They've got a titanium hammer. Uh, here's some shots of this one on the screen. In fact, one of my most beloved belongings is my Abbey Bike Tools Titanium Hammer. <laughs> my travel hammer, my camping hammer, my um, burglar hitter in the face her hammer, if that ever happened, maybe. Probably wouldn't do that, I'd get arrested for it. I don't want to do that, I'm not violent. Uh, it's, it's just beautiful kit, isn't it? And I saw this on Toolbox Wars, custom titanium hammer from Rollingdale uh, with a custom mock-up, very cool. And I looked into it, I was like, how are you gonna get it finished like that? And he linked through to titanium finishing. Look at this, which looks like Abbey tools. So this will be a titanium hammer or something like that, similar to this, but look at the finish on it. It's insane. What cool stuff. Now it's kind of made me think, um, well, firstly, do you need more hammers? I think, yeah, you could do with hammers of all sizes and all materials. And also it's made me interested in some of the more niche tool brands out there. Obviously we use Park stuff. I love Park stuff. It does me perfectly for everything, but I'm well aware there's loads of cool niche brands out there. So let's have a look. What's your favorite niche tool brands? Uh, what stuff are you into? Let's, uh, let's get talking about it on the show. Let us know if you've seen anything cool on any random websites like the Porter Cycles Mallet Hammer. It's just beautiful with that Ergon grip on there. And I think it's got butt loader in the bottom as well. It's like, they know what mechanics are like, don't they? Uh, super cool stuff. Uh, let us know. Okay, now into comments from last week's show. And I think it's pretty fair to say with the head tube badge topic, I opened a can of worms there because uh, for everyone that people agreed with, everyone's like, oh, you haven't mentioned this. So David Jenny says, how's Kotick not been mentioned? Joe Finney, Ragley's got a sick head tube badge. Uh, Simo, Ni Nikolai, I've got the best head tube badge, end of. Well, I disagree with that, it's a very nice one, but it's not mine, but it might be your favorite. And uh, this was the whole point of it though. And I guess some of you just didn't get involved in the discussion early enough, but it doesn't matter, better late than never. Um, although best comment I read was from Canon Firefly. Fun fact, in Australia, the Ibis is affectionately known as the bin chicken. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's just class. Uh, draw your own conclusions there with that one. And I did a thing, said I've got a metallic Rocky Mountain badge on my 2019 altitude. And James von Vacheres says the older Rockies were all handmade in Canada um, and they all had the proper head tube badges. So I was right, so they did used to have them. So I was, I was sure I remembered that. But uh, there's some really good comments in there and loads of bike brands I've forgotten about. It actually made me think, have you ever seen the logo game before? Could be like a head tube badge logo game out there. Mm, maybe I'll look at putting one together. Could be a bit of fun. Or maybe I'll get a behind the, sign, behind the scenes people to do it because it'll be easier for them uh, than it would be for me because I have to do other stuff as well. And oh, actually, big thanks to several people. In fact, in particular, George Gandhi and Matt Kavanagh for uh, the heart stuff that I reference. Now, I'm not really concerned about my, my health. I'm generally fit. I look after myself. I was just pretty shocked about that out of the blue high heart rate but it seems that uh, I'm not the only one that's had one of those and it's to be expected if you haven't ridden for a while. So again, I'm not that fussed about it, but thank you for your advice. Really good to read on there. And also nice to hear a few of you mentioning uh, where I reference mental health issues. I think it's a topic that's not discussed enough. Now it's not really the sort of place on GMBN Tech as such for this, but perhaps 
Uh, if you think there's enough interest, we could do something looking into mental health issues over on GMBN. There's obviously Mental Health Week. There's lots of different reasons for this, and they have referenced it several times on the Dirt Shed Show, but uh, if they did, I'd be really interested in getting involved with it because I know that a lot of you looking at the comments have referenced this. And I've got my own issues as well. You know, I you know I genuinely struggle. If I'm not riding my bike, the world doesn't go round. You know, it really is my channel to sort my head out really at times. So really cool to hear that some of you have the same things going on. Um, and also I've got an apology to make. I messed up twice. So on the show last week, I referenced, uh, I think it was in the quiz, about a specialized one being a semi-hydraulic post. Yeah, it's not, is it? It's a mechanical post. It's got an, it's still air pressurized, but it's a mechanical system on the inside. And there are a few other brands out there. So apologies if you watch my dropper post video where I was just basically stripping a cartridge style post. Um, that video is still fine, that's all good, but in the beginning I missed out the mechanical options and I said the Specialized was a hydraulic one, but uh, oh, there's a million things going on in the world. So I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Shoot me down. Sorry, I won't get it wrong again, I promise. <laughs> Okay, now back into quiz time. You know the drill, three questions coming up. Uh, this week we've got loosely a retro one, a techie one, and um, and another one. So uh, I'm gonna fire over the questions on screen and see if you can get the questions right. Okay, so first one, Onza, you know them as a modern brand, but they've been around for a very long time. They used to make a town wall tire called the Porcupine. There was another variant of it. What was so special about it? Okay, what was the prototype mule bike for the Nukeproof Giga called? And the last question, what is the current longest travel single crown fork available for mountain bikes on the market? Good luck, and we'll pick up the answers a little bit later. Oh, it's time to get all nostalgic with Rewind. This, of course, is the retro part of the show. Now, I'm well aware that we've not been featuring Rewind, Top Mod, and Bike Cave in every show, uh, basically because I've put the topic in and we've been using comments in there. So I like a bit of variety in the show. Um, if you agree with me, let us know. If you disagree, let us know how you'd like me to do things. So I'm open, I'm all ears. Well, more nose than ears, but uh, let us know. So this part is all about Rewind. We're talking about the old school stuff. So if you've got anything old, Get involved, send it in, come on. Don't be a stranger out there. We love talking about this stuff. Now, first shot coming up on your screen is an old Panaracer smoke tire in a pretty poor condition. I've got to say, fond memories of that tire because that was one of the greatest tires of all time. Back in sort of the late 80s and early 90s, well, early 90s really when this tire was around, that's what you had. You had a smoke and when the front tire came out of the darts, you had a smoke and darts. They were one of the first companies to do a front and rear specific tires, because there was Kona that did maximum reaction and then equilibrium and propulsion, um, and a few other brands out there, but really it was smoke and dart. That's what you had. That was the go-to, the Tamil versions. Uh, so this is from Kevin in New Jersey, USA. Uh, what's the longest lasting bike part you've ever had? I got this Panerasha smoke on eBay last year, rode it hard for three months before it finally gave up the ghost. Well, that's a tire that's, yeah, that's been around since the 90s, and you've been riding it like second hand, probably 20th hand looking at the state of it, but very cool. Um, P.S. If you still insist on disembarrance, I request you go back to time in the early 90s and interview Tomac and any of the legends at the time, explain to them that they're useless. <laughs> yeah, well, they were cool back then, but there were a lot of things that were cool back then that were just not very useful on mountain bikes. Um, I'm sorry, they were very useful, and I did think they were cool. I actually thought the coolest ones were the Syncross ones because they had that little part that went backwards as well as forwards in that cool shape. And they, I think they inserted with a wedge system into the bars. I might be wrong, but uh, but they were super cool. And of course they had bar ends. You still have them. Also had some of the x Light ones, which you'll know the brands now, a lot of you, as Muckoff. They had the x Light ones. They were, I can't remember what they're called, but they had like a machined end on them. And they were like knurled aluminium. And mine were, were red, but they ended up almost pink because they just kind of faded over time. Um, stumpies, stubbies, maybe, oh, I forget. But they were super cool back then, but just not necessary anymore. Um, okay, so in a few more shots, um, I'm gonna have a look at your retro build that you've linked on Tumblr actually separately, but there's the smoke and dart and the boxes. Yeah, 1.9, they did a 2.1 in those as well. I see you got the 2.1 up front, looking awesome. Yeah, nice to see those. Thank you for sending them in. Oh, there's the bike. Wow, Diamondback Axis. Uh, what fork is that on the front of there? So that's a Marzocchi, I can't see quite which model, classic zoom stem, turbo saddle, one of the, the all-time greats. You had a turbo, um, or you had the Salitalia flight, didn't you? So they were the two 
big boy saddles out there. They had a turbo light, of course, that's a regular turbo. So XT transmission on there, beautiful looking bike. Uh, and yeah, very fitting, all of it looks good. Um, I'll only disc bar-ins now because I just don't think they have a place in modern mountain biking with, with the reach on bikes and what you need the bike to do. But they definitely worked back then and they're part of it. So uh, hey, it's all tongue in cheek. You know me, I love bikes. Even if I say a bike is crap, I'm really not actually. I'm such a bike lover of all kinds. Uh, next up is from Simon. So this one, uh, he's currently got a 2021 Rock Hopper Sport. Brand new, very nice. But this, more importantly, this is 1994 Saracen Andes. I've got a soft spot for Saracen back then. That's when Saracen were in their golden years. Of course, their modern bikes are much better because they're just much, much better bikes, but, uh, but they were cooler back then, I think. I used to love the little S. They had like a pierced top tube that went through the seat tube and had the S on the, on the back end of there. Uh, lovely graphics on there. I can't remember what forks they were on there. You could just about see that S at the top of the shot there, actually, just above the reflector if you look close. Good name for the Andes on there, Max Shock. Maximum travel, yeah, probably not a lot on that thing. But loving the colours on there, I had that same Richie stem on mine. Uh, I also had grip shift on mine, although I fitted grip shift separately. Mine came with the or DX shifters on there, which broke at some point along the lines. I think we uh, hacksawed off the actual shifter because they were built in and then fitted grip shift on there. Uh, nice stuff, yeah, awesome. And there's you on your brand new bike, so a very fitting replacement as a hardtail. Uh, so you say, here's my 94 Saracen Andes, complete with grips, uh, grip shift and ball bars. Had this surpassed my GCSEs back in the day. Only just passed it on to new owner, currently riding a 2021 Rock Hopper Sport. Very nice. Awesome to see, and there's a cool little video to boot. And one last one from Rocky in the USA. This is a Michelin Hot S with a question mark. Yeah, I think you're right there, the red ones. Well, because there were so many different colours of tyres back in the day, weren't there? So there's a colour tyre which we're going to reference in uh, the quiz answers I nearly gave away to him. And Tioga did the Psycho in that sort of biscuity butterscotch colour, kind of like dog poo beige. Then there was the Amagama Grey that Specialized did. There was the red that Michelin did. There was the dual colours that Hutchinson did. There was, oh, tire colours. There was quite a lot. Forget off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, the Hot S was one of them. And what is that? Is that a Trans Alp or is that, I think that's a Trans Alp, looking at the bike it's on, because they also did the it was Comp 26 and Comp 16s and stuff out for downhill bikes. But Trans Alp, that was a great tire, that. Really, really good. Uh, kind of reminds me of the original um, Minion DHR, actually. A little bit like that, very similar. But awesome stuff to see. Uh, thanks for sending them in. Keep that retro stuff coming. Come on, come on, indulge me. Okay, now time for some quiz answers. So now let's see how you got on. So the first question was, Onzo used to make a tan wall tire called the Porcupine. And there was another famous variant of it. What's so special about it? Yeah, it was white. It was the white Porcupine. One of the most iconic tires of all time. Uh, yeah, they do look weird. And everyone thought they looked weird, but it kind of looked cool because it was the only white tire at the time. L much later, you could get the smoke and darts in their magic compound and magic tread design in a kind of a slightly off white, but still white with a tan wall. Like I said, Specialized did the Umma in gray. They also did, I think it was called Fast Red. I might be wrong, but Jason McCroy rode for them and he wanted red tires. So Specialized made it happen. And I've got a feeling there was no difference to Umma or anything else, but it ended up just dyeing them red, essentially. Yeah, the Tioga, uh, the Biscuit, Doc Poo, beige color, but uh, yeah, there we go. So the white porcupine, and now they're back. So if you're working on a modern retro bike, or if you just like the idea of white tires, that's the tire to run, I tell you. And in fact, it reminds me, I must get a pair. I've got a, a modern retro bike, 27 and a half inch wheel bike that I'm gonna to put together. So uh, whoever brings them in, I think it's Cycler Rose, I'll be on the phone to you, because I wanna get a set for that bike to uh, do something kind of cool with it. Okay, next up, what was the prototype mule for that new proof Giga called? Come on, I said in, in uh, news, didn't I? Yeah, it was the Mulse, odd name, which you can only guess it was a mule version of the Pulse, which they were working on, which became the Descent. And next up, what is the current longest travel single crown uh, fork you can get from Outbikes? Now, not including custom options that may exist out there, it's the RockShox Heb. Yeah, 190 millimeters of travel. Wow, that's a seriously a long travel fork, isn't it? If you think the boxers and downer forks, it's a 200 mil travel, so you've got 190 with a single crown. Isn't that insane? Crazy to think that, but uh, but still, RockShox did the 40 mil stanchion, 180 mil travel totem in 2007. 
2007. It's taken till 2021 to uh, have the Zeb out. Well, I shouldn't really say that. It's quite mean of me because the fact that Zeb is actually just far superior in every way. It's lighter, it's stronger, it's more efficient. It works in modern bikes. You get it in different offsets. It's nothing like the uh, Totem. However, the Totem was a great sign of what was to come. And that's it really for this week's show. So hopefully you enjoyed the show. Um, dead interested to know if anyone has had problems with the supply chain and stuff. Uh, as always, keep the comments positive because that's what we're here for, to spread positivity about mountain biking and tech. Uh, see you on next week's show. Ta-ra.